here. There we go. <clears throat> here with 52 Weeks with Jesus, our book. 52 Weeks with Jesus, part 26, A Hospitable Host. Uh, before we get started, I would like to say that this has probably been, um, and Blake preached on this, and I know I shouldn't be this way about negative, 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 but uh, this probably has been one of the uh, tougher weeks I've experienced um, all around, it seems like. Um, we've lost a dear member of our church family. Um, we have had a difficult work week. Um, my family has been on their 4th of July vacation at the campground all week, and I have had a miserable time of not, not don't take this wrong, Mom, I love you, and I've enjoyed our time together, but um, I don't like my family being gone, and this has been a tough, tough week. Um, other stuff I could go on and on, um, but I want to do like Blake said in his message and not give the devil any credit. It's been a tough week, but in the same, God has really blessed us, uh, blessed me this week. God has answered multiple prayers for me this week. Uh, I still have some that I'm awaiting to be answered, and I have full faith and confidence that God's going to answer those prayers just like he answered the others. Um, I have, not that I didn't already feel this way or didn't already know this, but I have experienced this week the feeling or the, the understanding, the knowledge of knowing that my hope is in Jesus alone. I have nothing in this world, no hope whatsoever, no hope in our government. Um, and it doesn't matter if you elect Trump or if you elect Biden or there's some third party that runs. I have no hope in our government to fix the world. Um, I love my medical people. Um, Allison and Anna and her mom are nurses. Uh, and love their jobs and are very good at their jobs, but I have, my hope is not in the medical field. Uh, my hope is not in, um, we've had discussions, uh, me and some others. Um, I took over the basketball league at Sardis this past year, absolutely loved it. Uh, had a great time um, running the thing with Tad, uh, enjoyed working, getting to work with my daughter. Uh, enjoyed getting to harass Trevor. Uh, Love the opportunity to work with a fine young man named Trey. Um, Jason, awesome referee. Heath, awesome referee. I, I loved every second of basketball season. My hope is not in basketball. If um, I could care less about basketball season. I could, I've learned, um, I love watching football on TV. I could care less if there's ever another football game played, ever. That's not where my hope is. My hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And without him, I, I don't know how you make it in this world. Um, this has nothing to do with 52 weeks of Jesus. I'm just, this is me this week. This is Jeremy. Um, I feel like I could just sit here thinking back on every day this week and just cry. But I have something greater awaiting me. I've been saved. I have a duty to do, and that kind of goes along with if you're 
remember we were going to do part 26 today and we're going to try to struggle through this. Um, this one kind of hits me a little different as I look at it because I would rename this one. Uh, it's called, what part 26 is called a hospitable host. And I would rename it if I could. What's your excuse? And I have to ask myself, what's my excuse? Today's Friday. I have been living the bachelor life, so to say, all week. I've had plenty of time. Read my Bible less this week than I have in a long time. What's my excuse? Um, I could have done probably two or three 52 Weeks with Jesus videos this week. Here it is Friday, and I'm just getting around to one. Uh, and to be honest with you, I, I was just planning on coming home and not even doing this, but I, what's my excuse? What am I doing? Um, I'm not called not to do anything for God. He's done too much for me. So we're going to get through this. one. Um, I don't have a lot of notes. Um, I just haven't sat down and, and done my notes. And that's no excuse. And that goes along with this, the hospitable host and the thought of what is your excuse. I'm going to read the scripture and we're going to go through this and we're going to see what God has to say. That's all I know to do. So I'm going to read from Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 24. That's the main verses for a hospitable hosts. So here we go. Like I'm all up on the screen. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 12, says, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, begin to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Um, hmm. We've been given an invitation to sit at the table with the Lord. What's your excuse for not answering the call? says here, he called in the, he told his servant to go out and get the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Uh, these others thought they were, they gave excuse uh, because they thought they had time or they thought this wasn't important or, or whatever. Uh, but God's going to get his. Uh, whether you give excuse or not, whether you do what you're supposed to or not for the Lord, the Lord's going to accomplish his cause. And if you won't do it, what he wants, 
if you're not going to answer the call, he'll find somebody else. Uh, so I don't know if that has anything to do with this or not. We're going to read, get into the book and read. It says, an offer not to be refused. I'm going to change this uh, just a little bit because it does talk about a band here, and U2 is an old band, and, and some of y'all might be a fan, but I'm going to try to update it here and say, uh, Luke Combs, because I know that's somebody that's very popular, at least to Ashley. I could care less about Luke Combs, but I know he's very popular, so I'm going to add him instead of you two. <clears throat> Imagine this. Luke Combs has just made an announcement that his band will be quitting. He's never going to sing again. Luke Combs is done. He'll perform one last farewell concert at Madison Square Garden in New York City, one night only. A popular DJ in Manhattan gets five free tickets with backstage passes, but company policy strictly prohibits him from using them. For days, he announces on Big Airway, a big on-air giveaway, offering the tickets to the 100th caller. He expects the phone lines to be jammed. When the magic day and hour arrive, not one person calls. Now time is ticking. The concert is only a few hours away, so the DJ begins calling his friends. One buddy said he had to take his child to soccer practice. Another friend said he and his wife usually went grocery shopping that night. Another man said he would like to go, but he was going to paint the bathroom instead. In complete disbelief, the DJ slams down the phone walks out into a city street and finds five homeless men sitting in front of the studio. Hey guys, I'd like to invite you, uh, invite you to an all-inclusive night at the arena across the street. It's Luke Combs' final concert. I've got five tickets with backstage stage passes and an all-you-can-eat buffet. Are you guys interested? At first, the stunned men are absolutely speechless. Then they jump to their feet happily to receive the tickets, enter the arena and enjoy front row seats at Luke Combs' last epic concert. What's that mean? Um, that's exactly what's going on in our world today. Uh, the Lord, and it's free, the Lord's offering free tickets to the kingdom of heaven. And it's getting close to time. I'm telling you people, just look around, turn the news on for about five seconds. It's getting close to being the last concert he's going to give. Yet we still have excuse after excuse after excuse. And when it's over, it's over. When death finds you, wherever it finds you, that's where you will be judged. If the Lord parts the skies right now, the condition your heart is in right this second is the condition it's going to stand before the Lord in. What's your excuse? No excuse will stand before God. I would hate to know that I walked out of this bedroom and fell over dead and didn't have the Lord in my heart and stood before him and he said, I called your name such and such time, such and such day, and you told me, sorry, Lord, I can't give my life to you right now. It's baseball season. I got to get to the park. Sorry, Lord, I can't give my life to you right now. My wife and kids are at the lake, and I want to change clothes real quick and run up there and fish with them for a little while, maybe tomorrow. Sorry, Lord. We, we give all kinds of excuses. Sorry, Lord, I don't want to give my life to you right now because I'm really hungry and I've got some pickle chips in here I want to eat. We give lame excuse after excuse why we won't answer the call as a, first as a lost person. Now I'm going to let me speak to the Christian person, okay? What is God calling you to do for him now and you're giving excuse after excuse after excuse? No excuse whatsoever will stand before the Lord God, me included. I, I'm, I'm just as guilty of excuses. Um, so I feel like I'm being, uh, coming off hateful, uh, but 
if you got a problem, I, I, this is where I'm at right now. And maybe it's just my week and my attitude. But if you got a problem with it, or if you feel like I'm being hateful or, or this bothers you that I say, um, no excuse to stand before the Lord. Get in the Bible. Take it up with him. Don't get mad at me. You can get mad at me. I don't care if you get mad at me. You can blast my name all you want to. But take it up with him. That's his word that says only those who answer the call, only those who accept the ticket. Okay, these, these guys, these friends, his buddies here could accept the Luke Combs tickets and been at the concert, but they had better things to do. What better thing do you have to do than become – a washed in the blood of Jesus, saved on my way to heaven person, especially in the times we live in right now. What better thing do you have to do? Uh, the next part says, an offer refused. Jesus wanted us to know that his father's kingdom is like that, like this story, like this parable. Instead of a concert, in Luke 14, Jesus describes a host inviting people to a meal. It's a Sabbath day, and Jesus is dining at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees who were watching him carefully. They were trying to trap him by getting him involved in a, in a debate that he could not win. To cut the tension, one of the men chimed in, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This man was not just making a statement. He was making an assumption. He was saying that he and all his pharisaical, pharisaical buddies would surely have a place at God's table in the kingdom of God. And that's how they felt. They, they kept the law. They thought they were better. They thought they deserved it. Uh, they didn't have to answer the call because they lived so, so above everybody else. But the fair, what the Pharisees failed to realize was that the kingdom of God was not something that they were to be looking for tomorrow. It was already present in Jesus. He was there in human flesh with them, and they wouldn't accept it. He invited them to follow him. He had invited them to fellowship with him. Feeling they'd already earned their spot in the kingdom, they turned down, uh, or they turned his invitation down. Um, not that the Bible doesn't say, and not that I'm, I'm not going to try to put Nicodemus in heaven or hell right now. Uh, but I will say, if you've never watched the, the series, The Chosen, go watch it. And the episode where uh, Nicodemus and Jesus uh, talk to each other. And then the next day, Jesus had invited him to go with them. And Nicodemus came so close to accepting the invitation. He was around the corner from Jesus in the episode. I don't want to give the episode away, but uh, there's a lot of people who are so close to giving in to the Lord, but they feel like they've already done whatever it is. They feel like they're going, not at, let's just get down to the, to the, uh, the meat and potatoes of this thing. Not everybody's going to heaven, okay? Good people are going to hell, okay? Uh, people who give to the poor, uh, people who do, quote, unquote, what's right. Uh, I'll go as far to say that there's going to be people in the church uh, that don't make it in the gates. Going to church is not getting you to heaven, just like these Pharisees. They need the laws inside and out, but they weren't accepting the invitation to follow Jesus. He was right there. They could reach out and touch him, and they wouldn't accept that it was him because they had all these traditions and beliefs and everything else, and, and we get that with traditions and routines, and let's break these routines. Let's break these traditions. Let's be true followers of Christ and do what he says. Have I heard God's invitation to me? Jesus is the host of the big party, inviting everyone to be part of his kingdom and to have a seat at his table. The meal has been prepared, it is hot, and ready to eat. In the Middle East, there were actually two invitations that were sent out for a banquet. There was an invitation that would be sent out far enough ahead of the banquet so that people could put the date on their calendar. They would know the day of the banquet, but they wouldn't know the exact hour. Does that sound familiar? We know God's, we know Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. 
but we know he's coming back, so we better be prepared, right? So, these invitations were sent with an RSVP. Everybody would have to let the host know that they were coming so the host would know how much meat to cook, how much bread to bake, and how much wine to serve. Just before the feast began, the host would send out his servants to give the second invitation for the guests to come. The first invitation had already been given. The guests had already agreed to come, and now they needed to take their places at the table. And the feast they'd enjoy was free, okay? So he's saying they would give an invitation. Uh, you would say, hey, I I'm coming to your house. I'll come eat with you, but you know, I don't know when it is. Um, and then the second invitation would come out and they would say, now's the time, okay? That second invitation, let's put it over into, into how it works with the Lord. Uh, the Lord extends that invitation and you need to accept that first invitation uh, and follow him. But the second invitation is going to be too late. Second invitation is when Jesus steps out to take his church home. And if you've not prepared to go then, there is no, well, you can come five minutes from now. Uh, it's then. Have I honored God's invitation to me? The door was open, the host was waiting, and the silverware and the china were in place. The dishes were filled to overflowing with meats, vegetables, and fruits. The goblets were filled with wine. The host scanned the horizon looking for his guests, but no one showed up because they had all made excuses. Not even good ones either. The first one said he had bought a field and had to go see it. But to buy or sell good cropland was a long, exacting process that would stretch over months and sometimes even years. Because Israel has a lot of desert land as well as some land suitable for farming, the farmer no doubt learned everything he could about the land to make sure he could make money off of it. The next guest is about five yoke of oxen. Normally one man could only work with one yoke, but this man had bought five. He wasn't a small time farmer, this was a big time rancher, probably owning close to 100 acres. No rancher would have bought such valuable animals without looking at them. A third guest used the weak excuse of a recent marriage. Yet what woman doesn't like to dress up for a party? But like the others, this man didn't go to the banquet because he didn't want to go to the banquet. But there is no legitimate excuse to reject God's invitation to be a part of his family or to have a place at his table. To reject God's gracious invitation dishonors the one who loved you enough to send the son to die for you. I wanna go back and look at the first two in particular. The first guy's excuse was he had bought all, um, yeah, bought all this land. Okay, that's great. Second guy's excuse was he had bought all these oxen. That's great. Uh, when the Lord comes, I believe it might have even been the last, the last one we read, when the Lord comes and says, today's the day you stand before me, the land's not going with you. The oxen's not going with you. Uh, the, the, the football trophy's not going with you. The big screen TV's not going with you. The big party you had last night's not, none of that stuff goes. But we put so much emphasis on worldly things and we get our eyes distracted off godly things uh, that we miss and we reject God's call on our life. And I'll, I, I mean, it's just blunt to reject God's gracious invitation dishonors the one who loved you enough to send his son to die for you. You realize he died for you and for me. But we put baseball, basketball, football, work, family, um, jobs, all these things way up here and God way down here. My job has never died for me. There's not a basketball player in the world, present, past, or future, that's ever died for me, but Jesus did. So why are all these things up here and Jesus down here? Have I heeded God's invitation to me? The host is obviously a rich man, but when his guest refuses offer, 
he goes to the down and out. This time, there was not a unanimous no, but a unanimous yes. Can you imagine how thrilled they would be to receive this invitation? I can. This is his story of his invitation. Once former President George H.W. Bush was in Atlanta, and I was invited to bring my sons to a fundraising dinner for a candidate who was running for election. I was told we would be sitting at the table with the former president. I didn't say, I wish I could, but I've got to go to Kroger's and shop. I didn't even say, sorry, but I've got a golf match today. I said, I'll be there. Okay, now let's put that in our terms. Okay, I'm an Alabama fan. We've got a lot of Alabama fans, okay? You've been invited to come to whatever, a banquet, um, watch a movie, a speech, I, who cares what it is. You're sitting at a table eating a steak and the person who's gonna be sitting next to you is Nick Saban. Okay, now let's flip it because not, unfortunately not everybody's an Alabama fan. Let's go to Auburn fans. Okay, Auburn fans, same deal. You're sitting at the table eating the steak right next to Gus Malzahn. And I'm gonna go for my family in Georgia as far as Georgia fans, okay? Kirby Smart sitting at the table with you eating a steak. I don't think I'm gonna go the grass needs mowed. Uh, well, I was thinking about taking Parker over to the batting cages to hit a few. Um, maybe I'll have another chance to sit at the table and eat a steak with Nick Saban next week. Um, sorry, I've had a hard day at work. I'd rather take a nap. This is excuses we give every day. And we don't even realize it. When we put those things before God, excuses after excuses after excuses, and none will stand before God. I received that invitation. I honored that invitation. I heeded that invitation. Now my sons and I have a memory we will never forget. We've all been given a far greater invitation to sit at the table of the creator of the universe, the king of kings, and Lord of Lords, and in who enjoy his presence forever. So, let's go. I, sometimes I do this one, sometimes I don't. This week's question. When Jesus called you, did you drop everything to show up at his banquet? Okay. I'm going to get personal. When Jesus called me, I had nothing. Uh, Y'all that know my story, I was in the airport at Chicago, desperate um, and he was all the only hope and I knew right then it was then or never so yeah I dropped everything but now let's go to the second part of this question okay and I'm gonna say oh me and if you don't say oh me you're lying to yourself even if when G when you when you I'm speaking to the Christian here when you surrendered your heart and life to God and said God it's all yours. I'm going to do whatever you want. I love you so much. Thank you for saving my soul. And then life comes by. Do you today? Oh, me. When God comes by and offers that invitation for me to speak to somebody, that might be lost. It might, I might be the last person that they speak to that, that, that's just called to share the gospel. Do I drop everything to do what God's called me to do today? Oh, me. Excuses, 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 excuses will never stand before the throne of God. Um, that's part 26, a hospitable host. We got through that. One. Next time we get together, we're going to do part 27. Uh, 52 Weeks with Jesus. We're on the downhill slope now. And I got a new book. When we get done with 52 Weeks with Jesus, we're going to jump over into oh, top parts orange so it matches my backdrop. But this one's called 52 Weeks Through the Bible. So it goes from, I believe, looking at the, um, whatever you call that, at the front, table of contents. Um, takes us pretty much from Genesis to Revelations, to Revelation. But anyway, 
Next time will be part 27, and it is entitled The Object of Our Worship. The Object of Our Worship. If you are reading along at home and would like to know the scriptures, the main scripture to go with next week or next time is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Other scripture to go along. Uh, math, and, and I suggest reading it in this order because that's the order they put it in, probably for a reason. But Matthew chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. Matthew 7, verses 14 through 23. Then back up a little bit and read Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. 7, 1 through 5. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We'll do that next time. The object of our worship. Um, I haven't, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I haven't read this one yet, um, but let me put this thought in your head. What is the object of your worship? Is it the Lord? Is it money? Is it sports? Is it fame? Is it family? Um, I want to challenge you to deeply think, not just say, yes, God is the object of my worship. God is number one. Deeply think in your life right now, what is number one? And we'll discuss that next week. So I love all of you. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Please stay safe. Um, I would say wear a mask, but some people like wearing masks, some people don't. Um, so I'll just leave it with please stay safe. Love y'all, and we will see you next time.